I was praying with someone just now, and I kept, I just kept thinking about the storms of life, and and one of the things I would, I said something about the fact that the Lord is being in our boat, and being in our boat, but but, but the connection to that immediately when I said it brought me back to Jonah. And I remember when I was recently preaching on Jonah that there's this that there's this obvious close connection between Jonah in the boat and Jesus in the boat. I mean, it's obvious. Like, the Bible didn't accidentally put that there. Uh, there's an interconnection because both of them have a storm. And, but if you look at the situation, the mariners have Jonah in the boat and they're all freaking out. Everybody on the deck of the boat is completely freaking out except for Jonah and it's because he's fast asleep in the bottom of the boat. But the reason that Jonah is fast asleep in the bottom of the boat is not because he has the peace of God moving and operating in his heart. But it's because he's hard towards God. He's rebelling against God and he's going in the opposite direction of God. And everybody on the deck of that boat is freaking out because they're in the midst of the storm and there's chaos in their life because Jonah is in their boat. And the answer to causing the winds to stop blowing and the waves to stop crashing, to bring peace in the midst of the storm, is to get Jonah out the boat. But now fast forward to the time of Jesus. Say it has another storm, another situation, another boat, people in the boat, people still freaking out in the boat. How can he sleep? How can he sleep in the midst of this storm? And when they wake up the Lord, the Lord says, oh, you have little faith. And he speaks to the storm. And the winds and the seas obey him. He brings calm in the storm. I'll preach it again one day. And I know I've already asked the question before. Who's in your boat? But now I understand it even a little bit better. Isn't that beautiful how the word of the Lord is? I understand it a little bit better today than I did the other day. The question is, do we have Jesus in the boat? Or do we have something else that's reflective of Jonah in our boat? Because I got to tell you that you got to put the Lord in your boat in the midst of the storm that you're facing. And he will bring you through. He's the great navigator. He's the great captain. Amen. And he will bring us through. So I just want to encourage you with that this morning. That's just a little bit something extra. Amen. That wasn't in the message. Or at least not directly. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 10. While we're turning there, while they're getting that ready on the screen, I want to thank, I want to wish all the fathers one more time a happy Father's Day. We got some new fathers that came in since I first said happy Father's Day. But you know, as I was also thinking up there, really who deserves a happy Father's Day is the father. Yes. Amen. Because yes. he's been a real good father. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. And even I'm just telling you, even though I haven't been all that good, he's been a good, good father. And sometimes, listen, I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes, I mean, none of my kids are here yet. They're probably not even tuned in on the internet. But, you know, sometimes I try to be a good father no matter how my kids act. I'm just saying, or how they have acted, or whatever the case. But I fall short. But, but our Father in Heaven, He never falls short. Amen. He sent us His Son. He made a way for you and I to have access to his presence. Amen. Let's read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 10. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing where he went. By faith, he sojourned or traveled in the land of promise as in a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Let's read that verse 10 one more time. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Is God. I titled my message this morning, Our Father of Faith. Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you and praise you for this 
morning, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to come into your house, to congregate together in fellowship, Lord God, to, to not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Lord, you moved in the midst of the song service. I've been praying that you'd move through the song, Lord, that you'd move through the messages. Lord God, that you'd begin to move upon our hearts, Lord, and to draw us all into a closer walk with you. We just want to thank you this morning and give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The character that I want to really focus on this morning is Abraham. And, you know, the Bible does call him the father of the faith. Uh, it talks about the fact that he is our father. Um, but whenever we look at, back at some of these verses that I just read, where it's, it's talking in the New Testament passage of Hebrews, and it mentions Abraham, and it says, when he was called to go out into a place, and it describes the fact that he didn't really know this place. He was really a stranger to the place that God was calling him to go. Now, I want you to know this morning, because maybe we're all at different levels of our understanding of the Bible, and that's kind of normal in every church, that there's, not, there's a lot of similarities to the calling of God in your life and in my life. Like, you know, you didn't just wake up one day. Now, if you, if you look at the, the Rasmussen poll that they do pretty much every year, and it says, how many people in America are Christians? I don't know what the latest one said, but about five years ago it was 85%. People say in America that they're Christians. But I got to tell you that th that's, that's really not legit. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm not the Holy Spirit, so I can't see in each and every 85% of that population whether or not they're truly saved or not. That's not even my job. I don't even want that job. Okay, but what I will tell you is this. A lot of people believe that they call themselves Christian or they identify with Christianity because their mom and dad were Christians and they were born in a house that believed that kind of thing or they're part of a religion that uses the name of Jesus. But the reality of it is, is this, is that in order to be a true Christian, you have to be born again. I didn't write that. The Bible says that. Amen. Jesus said that in John chapter 3. Whenever he told the religious leader, he says, Verily, verily, unless a man is, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor can he enter into it. See, before you're born again, you can't even see, spiritually speaking, that there even is a kingdom of God. But when you get born again, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. And he opens up your spiritual eyes. That's why the Apostle Paul prayed for the church in, in Ephesus in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's 1 verse 18. When he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. The Apostle Paul is praying that we would be able to see spiritual things. That can't happen till you get born again. Well, okay, preacher, how do I get born again? It's not really that hard. It's not hard to get born again. It's, it's much more of a difficult task to continue to walk for the Lord. You don't have to know much to get born again. What you need to know is this. That the first time you were born physically, you were born like your father Adam. You don't even really have to know it like that. That's just the way I explain it. You just got to know you're a sinner and you need a savior. Amen. Because see, if you think, oh no, I'm pretty good. Because I've never committed adultery. I've never murdered anybody. I've never lied. You're a liar. You know you lie. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Help me out. Is it okay if I just tell the truth? I'm not over here trying to poke nobody in the eyeball. You just got to learn to love me for who I am. But if you say you didn't lie, you lie right now. Everybody said a lie. Even people that don't like the lie have lied. I never stole. Come on, man. You never took a piece of candy out of the store. My point is, is that if you can't keep the whole law, then you broke the whole law. That's what the word of God says. Why? Because God wanted us to come to the realization that we needed a savior. So you were born a sinner, just like I was born a sinner, but God sent a savior. And ultimately he sent us Jesus and Jesus died on the cross. He was the sinless one and he paid the penalty for your sin because the wages of sin is death. Does that make sense? So payment for your salvation has been provided when Jesus died to pay the wage of sin back to the Father. So in order for you as an individual, in order for me as an individual to become a born-again believer, we have to believe that in our heart. And the Bible says in Romans 10, you've got to believe it in your heart and you've got to confess it to your, with your mouth. You don't have to confess it to me. You don't have to confess it to the person on the side of you. What you got to do, though, is you got to confess it and mean business with God. Amen. The good news is this, is that God knows when you mean business with him. The preacher doesn't need to know when you mean business with him. God needs to know when you mean business with him. 
And when you do business with God, then what happens is a spiritual miracle takes place on the inside of your heart. That's what it means to be born again. You can't save yourself. Coming to this church isn't going to save you any more than going to another church up or down the road. You know, getting involved in ministry isn't going to save you any more than not getting involved in ministry. What saves you is faith. Faith in that God had a plan, has a plan and that he's enacted that plan. God has done his part. As a matter of fact, just real quick, since Abraham is the character that we're going to talk about this morning, if you stop and you think, this is why I like to do this. If you stop and you think the work, if we can look at it as work in the terms of man, that's all I'm trying. I'm just trying to give us a, a focal point. Have you ever had a hard job? Are you a hard worker? I hope you are. Do you have good work ethic? I hope you do. But have you ever, do you ever remember a hard job that you had where you had to get out there, maybe even in the blister and heat, and you had to grind it out, and, you had, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to keep on grinding. In that sense, God's done a lot of work to get us Jesus. I mean, listen, it started with Abraham. I'm just saying, after the fall... And him creating a people for himself, it starts with Abraham. Oh, the plan of redemption started way back in the garden. But I'm talking about for God to create a people for himself, it starts with Abraham. And we're going to read it in a moment. But when he called Abraham out, and that's what this verse is talking about. He said, God is, he called him to go into another place. That he would receive for an inheritance. And he did not know where he was going. It, it, listen, the walk of faith is different because God is asking us to forsake what we previously knew. We may not even understand exactly what that means. Even right now sitting here, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you, part of what it means is, is that all of the things that you learned from your people, unless they were born again, Holy Spirit filled parents, and they taught you the way. I'm not saying they weren't good parents. Come on, man. Don't shut down on me. I'm saying if they weren't born again, spirit filled parents, they tried to probably do, hopefully they tried to probably do the best that they could do for you. Amen? But if they were raised themselves in false religion and they led you down a path of false religion, then, then you ended up in false religion. And God has a plan, though, and he's saying, I need you to get out of that and I need you to follow me to where I'm asking you or telling you to go. He's not really asking, he's telling, and some are going to listen and some won't. And Abraham is a classic example of that. By faith, he journeyed to the land of promise as in a strange country. And he lived in tents. You know what the beautiful thing about a tent is? It's temporary. See, Abraham knew that this was not a long term. This earth is not his own. It's not his home. This earth is not your home, Christian. And if you're trying to plant trees... And, 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 and build your new house upon the foundation of this shifting sand that we call earth. And you're trying to find your happiness and your pleasure in the things that this earth provides temporarily. Oh, this is a poor mouth preacher. No, 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 no. If you find the right one that the Lord has planted for you, then there's going to be times of joy in your life. How can you not look at that beautiful little baby cooing and all happy and smiling and not love that little baby? Even my dog, man. I love that dog. <laughs> there's times of joy upon this earth. Yes, sir. God will give you more joy than you ever thought. But listen, when you're searching for joy in something else... Other than in your relationship with the Lord, I'm here to tell you, you're going to find disappointment many a time. Amen. And don't you wish that you could get everybody to line up with you according to the way, as you believe, and even the things that you've learned as a Christian? Some of you old schoolers up in here that have been, I'm talking about old school in the faith. I'm not talking about gray hairs on your head. I'm talking about, <laughs> you know, scars on your heart. That you've journeyed this, navigated this Christian walk, and you've had disappointments, and you've had frustrations, and things have happened to you that you didn't even understand. And you even went through seasons of bitterness and frustration because the very people that said that they were here to help you hurt you. But the reality of it is, is that you grew through it. Because you knew deep down and you deep down knower that the right way was to go his way. And so therefore you did not completely let go and go your own way. Now you might have gone through some valleys. You might have turned backwards. You might have went back 
towards the world a little bit. But in the end, the Lord still had his, he still had a hand on you. He still had a hold of you. And you did not want to turn away. And so guess what you did? You learned and you grew through those situations. It's so different living for God than what it was to live in the world. God is so different. He said, my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. First John chapter three, verse one says, what manner of love is this that you've bestowed upon us that you would call us the sons of God? A foreign love from another realm that came down here on this earth in Christ. And you and I are trying to learn how to experience what this love even looks like. That's what it means when it says what manner of love is describing love from a different tribe. It comes from a different place. We don't understand this. I don't care how good you think your love is sometimes. And I don't mean that to be ugly, but most of the time our love, even though we got love, and everybody's like, man, that, that, that dude loves, that, that girl loves. Look at, all they, look at all they do. Yeah, but guess what? Even our love at its best many times has improper motives behind it. And we're looking to get a little something, something out the deal. And if that don't speak to you, then I don't know what will. Because we got to be able to determine and judge our own hearts. we got to be able to see our own selves. I'm here to tell you, the Lord ain't never like that. The Lord is never like that. The Lord is all about what is right. The Lord is all about making you and I whole. The, lo the love of God is that he bankrupted heaven all for you, all for me, so that we can have life in him, so that we can walk with him, and we can learn, and then we can spend eternity. Amen. If you go back and you look at verse 10 again, he says, He looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I don't know about you, but for a long time, even after I got saved, see, I lived in Houston for a little while. <laughs> you know, I would turn 10 in Singapore. People don't realize Singapore is the most westernized country in Asia. Even back when we lived there in the 70s, it was like America. I mean, it was hustling and bustling. You had skyscrapers and you had shopping. I think that place was called the Shaw Center. My mom always... Mama, you like to shop. I'm just saying. She drug me around all through the streets of Singapore. I can still remember. Oh, we're going to buy this. We're going to buy that. We, oh, man, we were living large over there. And, and I'm here to tell you that sometimes whenever you live, you know, I live in Houston. I live in Latvia. We live in Singapore, man, shopping and buying. Woo-wee, the streets of the city, man. Things are happening and shaking and moving. And many times people think, oh, I got to find me a city to live in because it's boring in Patterson or it's boring in Morgan City. And that's the very thing I thought when I first got saved. Oh, man, Morgan City. Who wants to live in Morgan City? And my heart was yearning for something else. My heart, because you know what? My heart was yearning for everything other than looking for a city who's at the foundation had as God is the builder and the maker of that city. My heart yearned for something that the world was going to offer me, but in the end, it was just going to leave me dried up and empty instead of full of the will of God. But the father, hallelujah, called Abraham and said, would you follow me? You know, Abraham was asked to follow and to trust him at a time when there was very little known in the word of God about God's plan for his people. If you go back and you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, when God called Abraham, there were some elements that had already been revealed to the human race about what God was going to do. But very little was really understood at the time that Abraham was called by God. I oftentimes imagine what did that look like? What did the calling of Abraham look like? I mean, for, listen, it had to be pretty profound. Okay, the only thing that I know how to, to, to uh, compare it to is my own personal experiences. And, and personal experiences, when they line up with the Word of God, are okay. You got your own personal experience. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to make a, I'm just trying to make a reference when my sister had died and I was in that barroom bathroom and I had not been in a barroom in 12 years and I'm here doing what I'm doing and these two guys are over here and I overhear their conversation. I was in the stall. Okay. And, and they're over here at the latrine and I hear one of them say to the other one, man, my, this is what he would basically would say. My old lady left me and dude, it's bad. And all of a sudden, I didn't hear anything else of what they were saying because all of a sudden, God interrupted my little sin fest that I was at. 
my, the depression that I was under because my sister had taken her life. The pain and the heartache and the sorrow that I was experiencing. And like I had always done in the past, even though I now knew Jesus, I had ventured back off into the things of the world that had used to solace my pain. And I'd go to drinking beer and doing whatever. Oh, let me just numb it for a little while. I'll, for I'll deal with it tomorrow. Well, that don't work, my friend. And so there I find myself in the midst of this same old rut that I had always found myself in before. And all of a sudden, God interrupts and he says, listen to them. They need me. They all need me. Yeah, you, you know what? I'll look you in the eyeball and tell you this happened. Now, I know you got to believe him. I'll valid tell, witness. I don't know. You decide for that. I'm here to tell you that this happened to me. Listen to them. They need me. They all need me. And look at you. I can't even use you. Oh, you've always been willing to tell people about me, but only in a way where you could still look cool. No, you will lay your life down before me and you will present my word for the way that it is written. And then I will use you. I didn't even realize that people were presenting the word of the Lord in such a way that it wasn't written that way. That they were taking God's word and manipulating it and dissecting it and cutting and pasting and doing whatever they wanted with it. And presenting it in a way where it made people feel good. So therefore they like their preacher. And so therefore they keep on coming back and they keep putting money in the box. you got to deal with the Lord on what you're going to do with your money and where you're going to go to church. That's between you and Jesus. I'm just here to tell the truth of the way that I understand. Amen? Because that's what he called me to do. He didn't call me to make everybody happy. He didn't call me to say everything that's going to smooth everything over and make it smooth like butter. He called me to present it for the way that it's written. Amen? And, and, and through the process of time, I realized that I've learned a lot about what God's word does look like. But at that time, I didn't know. Much of anything about God's word, even though I had been a Christian for 12 years. I said all that to say this. I think of Abraham and what did his calling look like? Because there was no Christianity. There was no Israel at the time that God called Abraham. So what did it look like? Did he show up in a physical form? The Bible doesn't say that. How loud did he speak to the belly of Abraham? You understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm telling you right now, I, that's how I know it. I, I know the voice of the Lord better today than I did way back then. He interrupted, my friend. He interrupted. And listen, I wasn't thinking no more about the Lord at that moment in time than the man on the moon. I was traveling just like Jonah, trying to hide in the, in the, in the belly of a ship. And, and, and listen, all I can tell you is this. From what I remember is that, is that, that, that voice, I didn't hear a voice in my ears. But that voice, whatever was going on, it wasn't even coming from here. It wasn't even, it came from somewhere down here. So, and it started, and it came up. And, and, and it, but, but I knew that it was, it was, and it was a conversation. It wasn't something Matt wasn't out there just talking to himself. I'm trying to tell you. How, so how did it sound for Abraham? I don't really know. But I know that it was enough to know this, that Abraham was living in a house with his mama and his daddy and his daddy was an idol maker, and there was no nothing known about God other than the oral tradition that had been passed down through the years. And so there were some people that knew, but Abraham didn't know. And Abraham got up and he listened to God and he began to follow God. Amen. Now along the way, I'm telling you, there were some hiccups in Abraham's life. So I want to encourage you this morning because some of you are saying, man, I've had some hiccups in my life, some speed bumps, some potholes, some things that have tried to derail me. But I got good news for you. You're not the only one. Even the father of the faith had some of those in his life. You know, one of the things that I've also learned about the Bible is that God, God's plan for earth is a plan of fruitfulness. His plan for man is a plan of fruitfulness. Throughout the scriptures, we see repeated things, and I know you heard me talk about that, of harvest time, seed and harvest. He, God promised his people in the Old Testament, I'll give you the former and the latter rains. Why? So that they could have bumper crops, because God wanted to take care of his people. Listen, God wants to bless his people even on earth today. I believe that. He is a God of blessing. But he don't want to bless you just so you can have as the purpose your prosperity. No. God wants to bless you so that his purposes can be fulfilled. Whether it be 
giving you glory and honor, uh, not you, but giving himself glory and honor because of the change that has taken place in your life. And he brought you from way down here and he elevated you to over here or, or you, you, uh, God allowing you to be blessed so that you could use your finances for the kingdom of God. That's between you and Jesus. But I'm telling you, God wants to bless you in multiple ways. He said that in the Old Testament that if they would follow him, he would give them a land that flows with milk and honey, which describes abundance. He will provide the former and the latter rains. In the New Testament, he will winnow the grain, separate the wheat from the chaff, and he will put the grain in the storehouse and burn up the chaff. But when we can begin to see past the first layer of what fruitfulness means to us, let me slow down. When we can begin to see through the first layer of what fruitfulness means to us. What does fruitfulness mean to you? I don't know. You got your own definition of it in your heart. In your mind. You got your own mindset of what. If I get this, then this is going to be fruitfulness for me. You fill in the blank. Hmm. Oh, if I get me a beachside place on 30A in <laughs> Florida. Oh, and now I've arrived. Ooh, I'm also yeah, bring the youth, Naya, we're going to the beach, right? That, and that's how I'll justify it in my mind. Oh, Lord, we're going to use this for the youth group. Yeah. What? Yes, indeed. And there ain't nothing wrong, dude. If you're a multimillionaire and you do all that, well, then bless you, brother. Amen? Amen. Well, what is it in our mind that we think is fruitfulness? Right, right. Because, you know, what are we going to get out the deal in other words? That's the first layer. But once we begin to move past that first layer, then we begin to see the Lord's desires. That's good, yeah. The desires of the Lord's heart. Amen, amen. Have we ever thought about that before? How the Lord also has desires? I can tell you right now that the Lord interrupted me one time in prayer after the barroom experience. I'm over there praying. Lord, and I thought my heart was pure. I'm like, Lord, I need you to move in this situation in my life. I need you to do this. And the Lord, this is what the Lord told me. But what about me, Matt? What about me? Right. What about what I want? What about what about what I desire to do? See, you got a plan for your life. You got a plan for what you think that you know that you want. But what about me, Matt? What about what I want to do? Because I'm the one that called you out of darkness into this marvelous life. And I got a plan for your life. Amen. You got a plan for your life. What about him, church? What about God's will and desire? See, once we realize that, we begin to realize that his desires are eternal and they affect humanity as a whole. Now the picture gets a whole lot bigger than little old Matt in South Louisiana. Now the picture, now I start to I allow the Lord to change my behavior. See, you might even get on my nerves, but guess what? By the grace of the Lord, he will teach me to allow his fruit of the spirit to be produced in my life so that I don't have to respond the old way. I don't have to respond the old way, church. No, you might like to respond the old way. <coughs> And don't get me wrong, Matt's flesh likes to respond the old way. <coughs> to where when you say something irritating to me, I don't want to tell you something irritating back. But guess what? The Lord is trying to teach his people called by his name to handle their business different. Because just like Abraham was a stranger to the place that the Lord was taking him, you and I don't know exactly because we've been living in the world for so long. We've, we've accrued the ways of the world for so long that we tend to act more like the world than we do Jesus. That's why Christianity is a process. A process where self dies so that Jesus can live. Amen? We begin to realize His will is more important than our personal will. We begin to realize that when we demand our will, even though it's contrary to His will, that it creates conflict in both our lives and in the kingdom of God. It creates conflict in both our house and in His house. When that happens, we are pridefully making decisions in the flesh that lead to hindrances instead of fruitfulness. I right, hope this is getting right. through to you. I hope that this truth is getting through to you. Oh, but if I could just have this. Yeah, but guess what? You think that. And then you go on. You make it happen, my friend. And then you're going to see and you're going to experience. But guess what? Don't let go of the Lord. Don't you start blaming these things on God. Don't, Matt, don't you blame. The, you think I ain't going through stuff? You think that I don't face things too? Oh, no, I'm a human being just like you. And the enemy wants to kill me too. He wants to steal from me. He wants to destroy me. He wants to shut my mouth. He wants me to take my hands off the plow and to quit talking for Jesus. But I'm here to tell you this morning. Amen. There's a calling on our life. Amen. And we can't let the enemy have his way. 
But whenever we do, whenever we manufacture, we go our own way. We create an alternate situation. And guess what? It's going to be painful if you walk down that road. But don't let go of the Lord. Even though it's painful, don't let go of the Lord. Even though you made the wrong decision and you might have made a detour, don't let go of Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's right. When that happens, we are pridefully making decisions in the flesh that lead to hindrances instead of fruitfulness. So his will always first. That's a heading in my notes. His will always first. Amen? Amen? On the other hand, when we put his will first, we will be operating humbly instead of pridefully. In the spirit which will advance the kingdom of God and our own lives will also experience a blessing according to God's will because that is his promise to his people as they follow his will. Yeah. Oh, that's a good word. I wish I could really break it down real time for you. And all the little intricate details of our life. Because it's kind of like, it's kind of like, what's the big deal if, what's the big deal if I'm driving through, you know, Burger King? And, you know, I don't know if you were like me, but when I grew up, Burger King had a little song. I don't watch TV anymore. I don't watch cable TV. Back in the day, have it your way. Have it your way. Have it your way. It's something like that. Burger King or something like that. You can have it your way. Uh, hold the pickles. Hold the lettuce. Uh, you know, all we ask is that you let us. Let you have it your way. And so I drive up to the drive through and I'm like, hey. I want a cheeseburger, or I want a, uh, I don't know, a, big, a Whopper. I want a Whopper, and I want you to hold the lettuce and the tomato, and I want you to put a, some extra onions on there and make sure you put that pickle with that ketchup. But they didn't do it. Yeah. Or, you know, you drive up, and she's like, yeah, well, you can't have it your way today, sir. And so I'm like, well, let me tell you something, sister friend. I'm the pastor of the Crossway Ministry in Patterson, Louisiana. And in the name of the Lord, you're going to give me what I got come to me because I'm called by the Lord to walk in fruitfulness and righteousness. Now, you make sure it happens. Now, you see what I just did right there? I just created a conflict. And I made it funny, but look. Come on. There's many times that we like, oh no, I got some rights on this earth, my friend, and I'm about to exact vengeance. But the Lord said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right, right. Is it really going to hurt me to get a bad attitude and just say a little something that makes my flesh feel a little bit better? Listen, I'm not trying to act like none of us have arrived and we ain't perfect. But you know one of the things I've learned? When the Lord speaks to me and he's saying, why do you want to respond like that? Why do you feel like you have to get your day in court right now? You keep saying that I'm your defender. You keep saying that you're, that you're going to trust me to take care of you. But yet at the same time, you keep making decisions to take matters into your own hands. Why do you keep doing that? I'm speaking to you, son. Oh, but Lord, you know. And so I just keep doing it. Just little bitty things. I can tell you, I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to do it again. <laughs> One time I was getting ready to leave for Florida on vacation. Thank God for Florida vacation. Now, you know, I love me some Florida. So, But it's not the Lord's will for me to spend all my money right now on a beach house. I don't even have enough. But I was leaving for Florida. And I know I've told the story. I need to hustle up. Oh, Lord, it's already 11 o'clock. And they had the clips up. And they had the wrong clip up. We got these little clip things. You know, little flags. Green means I need to see the patient. Blue means that they're getting a shot. I see all my patients. It's Friday afternoon. I'm ready to jet out the floor to the blue clips up. They're going to give shots in that room. I'm out. I'm walking down the hallway, get in my car, halfway driving off. One of my nurses called, Matt, you left a patient in room four. <laughs> no, Matt ain't left no patient in room four. Y'all forgot to put the wrong clip up. All right, I'll be right back because you can't leave a patient in a room. How rude. <laughs> so I get back in there and I take my keys and I throw my keys up on the counter and I go see my patient. And I walk out, I'm about halfway down the hallway, and the Lord says, do you like my voice speaking to you? Mm. Do you like having a relationship with me? Mm. That's, I'm just telling you how the Lord speaks to me. Right, right. Because if you do, I suggest you get back in there, and you go apologize to Miss Judy for the way that you just handled your business. Because you don't look nothing like me, son. 
See, and that, the only reason I brought all that up is because I want us to be clear on something. Right. You can act however you want to act. You can yeah. do whatever you want to do. You can make the decisions that you want to make. But if you think there's not going to be repercussions on that, my friend, right. if you think that we, that we boldly and blatantly ignore the voice of the Lord, even in small little things, that we're going to be able to hear his voice as clearly the next time when he speaks, wrong. It doesn't work that way. That's it. And we really want to be able to hear the, the prompting and the leading and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We need to start learning how to listen to what it is that he's telling us and to go in the direction that he's calling us to go into. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's kind. Yes, his mercy endures. Hallelujah. And though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. That's what who God is. Yes. Yes. But at the same time, he's wanting us to listen. Amen, Christian? I don't even know if I'm going to be able to preach. I'm just going to preach this first verse right here. Psalm 37, verse 4. I was going to preach that whole psalm, and I hadn't even gotten to the story yet. I'm going to make a short version. Okay, I'm not going to keep you here all day. I know y'all need to go tell your daddies that you love them. All right. Look at this. this. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I want you to think about that. Because, see, most of the time we like... Give me the desires of my heart, Lord. I read your word in Matthew. I read your word in Mark. And the word of the Lord says that if I would pray anything in your name, that it's going to be done. He said, delight yourself in the Lord. You know what that word delight means? It means soft and luxurious. It's something that brings comfort. I think, you know, my sister that died, she used to like, uh, I don't know if mom would probably be surprised that I even remember this. She used to like satin pillowcase. That was something that Linda liked. Satin pillowcases. Satin sheets and satin pillowcases. I remember being a little kid. She'd say, get out of my room, Matthew. I'd be all up in there cuddling up on that pillow. It was so soft. Luxurious. Delighted. You know, can you imagine a soft and cuddly pillow with a satin pillowcase? Oh, man. This thing just bringing me joy thinking about it. I'm about to give me some rest. Peace and rest. What is the satin pillow in your life today? What is it that you're looking to delight yourself in? What is it that you think is going to bring you happiness upon this earth? Because the Lord said if we would delight ourselves in him, that he would give us the desires of our heart. You know what's happening, though, when we delight ourselves in the Lord? What's happening is, is that we're taking on his nature. What's happening is, is that we're allowing his character and his will to permeate our heart and our will. And the next thing you know, we're getting the mind of Christ and we're starting to think more like the Lord and less like us. And the next thing you know, we're starting to want the desires of the Lord. And hallelujah, God said, I'll give you those desires whenever your desires line up with my desires. All those scriptures I was telling you about in Matthew and Mark, he says, pray whatever you have a desire of, and in my name, I'm going to give it to you. And look at, but look at this. Look at John chapter, John chapter 15, verse 7. Look at that one real quick. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. If you abide in me, if you remain connected to the vine through faith, then guess what's happening? The Holy Spirit's flowing into your heart and he's changing the desires of your heart. Now he can answer that. But look at this. This is even more clear. 1 John 5, 14. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Look at verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If it's according to his will, if we're remaining connected to the vine and the heart of God is being produced in our heart and that begins to take over our prayer life and we're praying according to the desires of his heart. Yes, you have it, my friend. Amen. God wants to do the work. Amen. 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 There's other parts to this. Passage that talks about commit your ways to the Lord. Trust in Him. He'll bring it to pass. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. And that's a character of Abraham that we don't always see being manifest. Going back to Abraham, our father of faith. Abraham on more than one occasion took matters into his own hands. He wanted to rectify his problems and fix his situations. 
Abraham followed God, but Abraham also made bad choices that affected his house and the kingdom of God. Let's go backwards. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. This is what Hebrews was talking about. The Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house. You know that word kindred is basically saying kinfolk. From your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing and I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him and Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran and Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan and into the land of Canaan they came. See, we hear God's will clearly spoken in this passage of Scripture. Forsake everything you know for me and follow me and I will bless you and I will bless others because of you. There's a timeless truth to this. See, God uses people to bless others. But this is even more specific in that this promise is directly connected to how God would bless the whole world with Jesus. You got to just trust me on that. There's so many places in the Bible that explain that what he, God was talking about was he was going to give the world Jesus. And it had to start with Abraham. It started with Abraham and his willingness to hear the voice of God and to follow after God's will. Amen. See, many times when we hear the words forsake everything, I used to have preachers tell me that before. And I mean, listen, if God says it, then you better listen. They used to say, oh, you, you got a calling on your life, bro. You got to quit that good job you got. The Lord knows how to give and he knows how to take away. Last thing I want to do is listen to a man's voice if it's not congruent with the Lord's That's voice. Right. That's right. But what I will tell you is this, is that many times we have mindsets, oh, forsake everything. Sell it all. Move to Ethiopia. Yeah, the Lord told you to do that. <laughs> Sometimes it's forsaking mindsets that That's we have. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Mindsets that say, oh, but this is my family, even though my family is in false religion and they're pulling me away from the truth of the gospel. God said to Abraham, and that's the exact context of Abraham. Abraham's daddy, I told you already, his name was Terah. If you do a quick Google search on Terafim, T-E-R-A-P-H-I-M, Terafim, is describing a family God. His father, Terah, was a maker of idols. God said, get out of your father's house and I will make you a nation. Why? Because if you hang around in a house where there's idol makers, then you're not going to be able to move forward with me because there's a false religious spirit that's going to prevent you from moving forward in the things of God. Get out of your daddy's house. Get away from your kinfolk. If your kinfolk are causing you to go backwards. Oh, but my kinfolk say they love the Lord, but aren't they producing fruit? That looks like the Lord. Because if they're not, okay. you're going to have to learn. You hear from the Lord. Don't listen to your preacher. But, you, but you're going to have to start making some decisions if they're pulling you back. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's why Abraham's title in the Bible is the father of faith. Amen. Romans 4.10. He believed God's word. Follow his instructions. This is really a big thing if you consider it. Leave your father's house. Leave your country. Leave your kinfolk. I want you to trust me. I want you to break ranks. Break ties with everything and everyone that will prevent you from doing what I plan to do through you. The world system is different than the world, than the kingdom of God. It looks different. It, it, God's word is different than what everybody's telling us is the norm out there. Right. Right. And we learn it through his word. Amen. Listen, I want you to see this. Go to Genesis 12, 8 through 15. I want you to see the first place Abram sleeps. Or the first place the Bible tells us. Abram slept after he was called by God. The first place we sleep is the place where we all live our lives. We want to trust and move forward with God, but the world is still all around us trying to draw us back. But if you can see, I'm talking about if you can see with spiritual eyes, you will begin to see this world as nothing but a heap of ruins. Look at Genesis 12, verses 18, verse, verse 8, I meant. It says, And he removed from there unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. 
And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and he called upon the name of the Lord, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. I want you to see this. He's in the middle of two places. He's in the middle of a place called Bethel, and he's in the middle of a place called Ai. Bethel, you anybody know what the name Bethel means? House, I know. Of house of God. Bethel means house of God. What does the word Ai mean? It means a heap of ruins. Hmm. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that every Christian life, once you're born again, you're in the middle of a situation. You're in the middle of a situation because you still live on an earth that has fallen and is basically a heap of ruins. Right, and at right. the same time, the Lord's calling you to move closer and closer towards the house of God. Right. But each and every day that you wake up, you're in the midst of a situation with choices to make. Right, right. That's good. Just as it was for Abraham, so it is for Christian. We live in both places. And every day as we journey, we either walk towards the borders of Ai or the borders of Bethel. In other words, we either follow the spirit and move towards God's plan or we follow the flesh and move towards our own plans. When there is a famine, that's the next concept. When there is a famine, where will you go to eat? Look at Genesis chapter 12. We're going to go back to verse 10. Up to verse 10. It says there was a famine in the land. You know, whenever you face situations in your life, circumstances that cause frustration, it's like a famine. Right? You're, you're getting, things aren't going the way that you planned it for. You, sometimes we get desperate in situations. He says there was a famine in the land and Abram went down into Egypt to travel there for the famine was grievous in the land and it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt. I want you to know some Egypt is just another AI. Not literally, it's not literally spiritually speaking. Egypt is another AI. It's like the world. And Egypt will always be the world because God delivered his people out on the Passover night out of Egypt. Right. God delivered. God called Abraham out of his father's house. God called Israel out of Egypt. God don't want you and I pitching our tent in Ai. He don't want pit, us pitching our tent in Sodom. He doesn't want us living in the world. Right, right. Yeah. God delivered his people out of the hand of Egypt. And on that Passover night, God left Egypt in a heap of ruins. The plagues and the boisterous screams of death that filled the Egyptian night air that night, Egypt was left in ruins. This world in its fallen state is in a heap of ruins. And when you or I go walking towards these places, we are journeying towards the ruins of the world rather than the blessings of God. When we walk in the direction of the world, the decisions that we make become more worldly. And in our minds, we justify our actions because we confuse the ways of the world with the ways of God. We consider this as how everyone does it. Their world wisdom and practices begin to influence our wisdom and practices. We begin to exhibit compromise and other people see it. I want you to know that when you get saved, people watch you. If you dare mention that you're a born again Christian, right, right. watch out, baby. You're on right. the radar now. Right, right. They're watching you so close. They got you under a microscope. Mm -hmm. Check this out, Christian. When we live for God and speak for God, people watch our lives very closely and they scrutinize our decisions. And can you imagine right now who watches us more closely than anyone else? Family. Who do you think watches you the closest? Family. Family your children. Yep. Right? You guessed that our children watch us more closely. You know, let me just say a little something about that. And I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to try to help you. I love my kids with everything that's in me, but I'm going to tell you right now. You know what Jeremiah said? Jeremiah said, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked who can know it. I hate to say it, but even in my own children that I love with all of my heart, they got a heart that has a fallen nature in it. And listen, if you think that a kid can't manipulate a situation, because look, my kids are pretty smart. And one, of, and one of the most famous lines is, oh, yeah, but daddy, look what, ba 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 Look what you did. It, and so, you know, when the ne next time it happens, because the Lord spoke to me when I was writing all this. Next time it happens, I'm going to be like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to justify your own actions? You're trying to push whatever back on me to try to make yourself feel better because you're not moving forward in the things of God? If that makes you sleep good at night, my friend, then you go right ahead. I'm just trying to encourage you because, listen, yes, your children are watching you. But just because they come back and try to throw stuff in your face, their, their voice is not the one that you're supposed to listen to. You're supposed to listen to the voice of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, yeah, let the Holy Spirit change your heart because some of what they're saying is true. Right? Right. Uh -huh. But the devil will try to use your kids just like the Lord wants to use your kids. Amen. devil will try to speak stuff through them little kids 
or, or them big kids that are trying to tear you down. Yeah. Yeah. But the Lord wants to build you up. Amen. 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 Back to verse 11, Genesis 12, 11. And as we move forward, let's try to observe some things. Let's look for compromise. Let's try to see how Abraham's compromise affects others. And even more specifically, let's try to see how his compromise affects his offspring. Mm. Abraham's first decision of flesh and not trusting God, he goes to Egypt. Remember, there was a famine in the land. Look at verse 11. And it came to pass when he was come near into, to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, behold, now I know that you are a fair woman. In other words, you are a beautiful woman. And he says, you're a beautiful woman to look upon. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me. Why? Because Pharaoh wants you for himself. But they will save you alive. Say, I pray thee, or say this, I'm begging you. You say you're my sister. That it may be well with me. Now listen, <laughs> I don't want to get too deep in all this, but if you study, you'll realize that Abraham and Sarah were actually half brother and sister, right? They didn't have the same mom. Okay, and I know that it's not God's will according to the book of the law that, that believers would continue to intermarry because the law says not to do it, okay? But that, the law came 400 years after Abraham. And all I'm trying to say is if you really bring it back to the garden, at some point in time, brothers and sisters had to procreate. So at that point in time, it was God's will. But then when God said, we don't need to do that anymore, he said, it's not my will. And that's God, and he's sovereign, and he's in control. Amen. And we just let God be God, and we be, we be us, and we believe him at his word, and we don't bury our sister. <laughs> yes. Now, although the occult world did all that, the Egyptians did that kind of stuff even later. Rome did it even later, right? Anyway, let's not go there. This is his wife. They will kill me and they will save you. Say, I pray that you are my sister, that it may be well for me for your sake, for my soul shall live because of you. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Uh oh, that didn't work out. <laughs> now, the Lord ends up striking Pharaoh's house with plagues. So instead of Abraham being a blessing to the world, now he's a curse. Because because of his decision to do that, what the problem was is that he was fearful. Right, right. And we all experience fear in our lives. Yes, yes. And so we come up with a plan in our mind that we're going to fix it. Yes. Because we're fearful. Yes. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? What's going to happen 10 years from now? i got to do something. i got to make something happen to fix this situation. And then now I done opened up a new door that created a new scenario. And instead of being a blessing, the situation turns into a curse. Again, hold on. It ain't over until the Lord says it's over because God ain't done with Abraham yet. So just hold on, Christian. Because I know you're over there thinking, oh, Lord, that's me. Oh, Lord, I did the same thing. You got to be thinking that because I know I'm, th I'm thinking it. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but God ain't done yet, Christian. Hallelujah. God's going God's gonna to have his way. Amen? Glory, All yeah. right. He's got a plan. Amen. Later, he's traveling north. He makes a similar decision. Look at Genesis chapter 20, verse 2. It says, And Abram said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Oh, Lord, here we go again. Yeah. I mean, the last time you did this, God put plagues on Egypt. Now you want to do it again? Four, I'm sorry, six chapters later, uh, eight chapters later, you're going to do it again? The Bible also shows how a father's decisions affect their children. Because our children watch what we do. Isaac does the same thing that his dad had previously done. Look at Genesis 26, verses 1 through 7. Here we go again. There's a famine in the land. Beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, the Bible is clear. Scholars try to act like it's the same thing. The Bible said it wasn't. I'm talking about liberal scholars that don't believe the inspiration of the word. And Isaac went to Abimelech. What I see my daddy do is what I'm going to do. King of the Philistines under Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down to Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell you, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. 
For unto you and unto your seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And I will give your seed all these countries, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. Isn't that, does that sometimes confuse you? Or you're like, is it, because, it, dude, I'm going to tell you right now, people that try to... Uh, reject the Bible and try to cause confusion and be like, look at this, man. Your preacher. I watched a video of your preacher and he sat there and preached to y'all and told you that the Bible contradicted itself and you didn't even catch it. You should have caught that. Your preacher sitting there preaching. The Bible ain't even real. Because why? Because the Bible's saying of Abraham that he listened to God, but the Bible's also saying that about Abraham that he didn't listen to God. And I want you to know that when, it looked, when God called Abraham out of his father's house, Abraham said, hey, we're packing our bags and we're leaving. I don't even know where I'm going, but I know that I got spoken to way deep down in my belly. And the God that spoke to me said, hey, I'm going to bless those that bless you. Curse those that curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And boy, look, he was so, he had so much pep in his step when he first walked across that threshold. Oh yeah! Look, it's going to be good out there. The land of plenty. God's going to take care of me. And look, by the next day, he was probably already frustrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. He's probably already frustrated. Oh, but Lord, I didn't know it was going to be like this. Yeah, well, guess what? You just keep on trusting. Yeah. And then I go and I'm going to manipulate this. And I'm going to manipulate that. And I'm going to fix this. But guess what? In the end, he was still looking for a God. A city who's, who God was a builder and a maker. Hallelujah. Abraham believed God. And it was given, accounted unto him as righteousness. And that's the word that the Lord would speak to you. Matthew 25. Hallelujah. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Not that you never messed up. Not that you never made bad decisions that caused you to turn to the left, to the right or to the left. But that in the end, yes. you held on yes. to the Lord. Amen. Yes. Yes. And you served Him all the days of the Hallelujah. Don't let the enemies derail you. Mm -hmm. Don't let the enemy lie to you. That's it. Yes, there's going to be hard times and there's going to be frustrating times. But you hold on to Jesus. Hallelujah. When we look at the decisions of Abraham, we see the similarities between the decisions he made and the decisions his son Isaac made. They both obviously want to serve God, do they not? Yes, of course they do. They want to serve God. But they both compromise with truth, which puts their family and their calling in danger. There can be little argument that the Bible is drawing our attention to the way that Isaac's observations of his father have affected his decisions. It's possible that these men are focused on the good they do and conveniently disregard what seems like small matters. Are you, what about you? What about me? Do we do that? We look at our life as a whole. Look at all this good I'm doing. And we ignore the little things. Yeah. That we're doing. It. God's not cool. Come on. See, compromise leads to more compromise. Ishmael. Right. Yeah. Ishmael was actually in the middle of these two occurrences. What is Ishmael? Well, look, in the middle of Egypt and Gerar was Ishmael. Ishmael was a much bigger compromise compared to Egypt or Gerar. Fleshly decisions don't go away easily, my friend. Mm. Fleshly, let me say that one more time. Fleshly decisions do not go away easily. Genesis 16, 1 through 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. You know what's sad is, is this, is that Sarah's womb is bare at this point. And for a woman, that's a big thing. Or at least for a woman that wants to have a child, that's a huge thing. And so Sarah's over there trying to figure out what to do. She feels like she's letting Abraham down because God promised Abraham that he'd have an offspring, a seed, and that God would, would fulfill multiple promises through the promise that he gave to Abraham. But things aren't working, and I'm sure with time Sarah starts to blame herself. It's not working, but it's my fault because I'm the one with the barren womb. We don't even know that. Nowadays with science, I mean, look, for all we know, it's, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but the sperm count couldn't be well. Whatever the reason, God was allowing it. Well, the scripture does say that her womb was bare. So let's just, put, let's just leave it to the Lord. Amen. I'm just trying to make a point. Sometimes there's things going on and we don't know what the reason is. Amen. Right, right. It says right here, and eventually enough compromise will lead to a curse. Is what I'm trying to tell you. Because she says, go into the my handmaid, Hagar. That was a common practice during that time. 
I'm telling you, there was a whole system to it. Abraham goes in, he lays with Hagar. He inseminates her ovum. She gets pregnant for him. When it's time for Hagar to have the baby, Sarah sits down on a stool and the Hagar sits between her lap. I know it seems strange. And she gives birth to the baby and the midwife pulls the baby out as though Sarah had given birth to it. That was the custom. Mm -hmm. The problem is the Lord ain't said to do that. Right. As a matter of fact, later on he says, Isaac shall his name be called. Well, when you're in your years and you're 99 and Sarah's 90 and you couldn't have produced it yourself is when I want to produce it for you so that I get the glory. Not you making decisions and fixing stuff and trying to handle business in your own hands like you did in Egypt, like you did in Gerar. No, I want you to trust me. Amen. See, eventually enough compromise will lead to a curse. It can lead to a curse in your ministry, your business, your relationships, your friendships, and your family. Whereas compromise brings a curse, and where the curse is, there is barrenness or unfruitfulness. It's important to understand that sometimes unfruitfulness or barrenness is not always because of compromise. Amen? Sometimes it's because God is protecting us in a certain area. Right. Do you believe that God knows the beginning from the end and all points in between? Right. Do you believe that God knows what's better for you yeah. than what you know for yourself? I do. I don't always do it right, but I know that God knows better for me than I know for myself. It's important to understand that it's not always that way. In other words, if he allowed those pastures, I'm talking about the wrong ones. If he allowed the wrong pastures and plains to be well watered and green, we may walk in that direction. We might set our tent up because it looks good, but it isn't God. We may go there thinking it's his will, when in reality it's only a mirage instead of an oasis. This is where continued trust and believing that God has our best interest in mind comes into play. And we trust Him and follow Him no matter how bad it gets. No matter what, if we made a wrong turn and it starts getting ugly and it starts getting painful, we're still going to hold on to Jesus. Amen. Oh man, look, I want to be like a bulldog. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? You know, the Lord would never be that way, but I can imagine the Lord dragging it. And I'm holding on. Oh, I'm holding on to you, Lord. All right. I want to be like Caleb. Dog. Call me dog. I'm going to be tenacious and hold on to the Lord. Yeah. I need yeah. the Holy Spirit to do that. Amen. <laughs> hey, I don't care how much tenacity Matt thinks he has. He ain't got enough to hold on to the Lord in a right. spiritual battle without right. God's help. That's it. Here's my conclusion. If compromise brings a curse, faithfulness produces fruit. Look at Genesis 20. <coughs> Verse 17, and we're going to read it all the way through 21, verse 4. It says, now this is whenever he's in Gerar with Abimelech. So Abraham prayed unto God because God told Gerar, you need to let that woman go. That's not your, that's not your woman. That's Abraham's woman. You need to let her go. And, I'm, and he's a prophet. And I'm going to get him to pray for you. And I'm going to restore you. So Abimelech lets her go. So Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants. And they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. At the set time of which... God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. We're going to close with a song, amen. We're going to give the opportunity of the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts one more time before we go home. But as they're getting ready up here, I want to just point out to you that in this last passage we read, that God, even though Abraham had made bad decisions, even though he had made bad choices, God still gave him an opportunity to be used by him. And as soon as Abraham went in the direction that God was asking him to go, what did God do? God healed the people around him, but he also healed Abraham. Amen. What I'm trying to say is, is that if we're trying to fix things in our own strength, and sometimes we're just getting in the way of God. But when we would surrender to the will of the Lord, he's not only going to heal your land, he's going to heal the land of the people around you. He wants to use you to produce fruit in people's lives. Even after Abraham had to compromise with Abimelech and Gerar, God made a way to keep his promises. 
Once Abraham prayed for Abimelech, God blessed both him and Abraham. God wants us to stay focused on his will for our lives. And when we do, he will bless both us and others around us. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. If you need prayer this morning, I want you to know the altars are open. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out, not knowing where he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Thank you, Jesus.